Chapter 70 An hour after Jeremy and Craig came home, Chris left for the farm on his bicycle. He made it there in record time. He pulled into the barnyard and skidded to a halt in front of the entrance to the milking parlor. He set the bike against the barn and locked the rear wheel with its chain. Even Lancaster wasn't immune to the occasional bicycle thief. He stood, hearing something, and turned toward the sound. Hiram came out of the Victorian. He closed the door, locked it, and slipped his keys into his pocket. They saw each other, but said nothing. Chris went into the barn to prepare for the milking. This was the first day Chris remembered wanting to call out sick. Just being in Hiram's company was making his flesh crawl. Tomorrow wouldn't be so bad. At least when he worked in the morning, the old man rarely got out of bed. Chris sat down on the bench in the narrow coat room and took off his sneakers. He fished around underneath for his waterproof boots. He found them and yawned. He was tired after staying up with Derek most of the night. It was a busy day around the house, too, especially after Matt showed up. Chris shook his head, remembering what happened when his friend arrived. Matt was such a bonehead sometimes. He managed to say the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong time not long after he arrived. The whole day was filled with trauma that started first thing in the morning. Jeremy and Craig had just left for the market, narrowly escaping Virginia's ever-vigilant inquiries. It was up to Chris to explain why they were laughing so much. Derek was no help. Each time Virginia glanced in his direction, he burst out renewed laughter. It wasn't long before he was rolling around on the kitchen floor, gasping for breath, his face the color of a tomato. Chris bent over, picked him up, and slung him over his shoulder like a sack of wheat. Come on, lobster boy, Chris sighed, trying to keep a straight face. Time to take a shower. I suppose no one's going to tell me what's so funny, Virginia asked. Derek laughed even harder. Chris said nothing as he climbed the stairs, choosing the best answer is not to answer option. Derek was laughing so hard he couldn't answer. Guess not, Virginia said, walking to the coffee pot. I have a strange household. Chris deposited Derek on his feet in the hallway and gave him a moment to compose himself. He almost had a coronary when Derek slipped his underwear off and tossed them into his room. He went into the bathroom and closed the door. A few seconds later, the shower came on. Chris grabbed Derek's underwear off the floor and tossed them into the laundry basket in his closet. That's another thing, Chris thought, aggravated. I know how Derek keeps his room at home, a lot like Jeremy's. If he thinks he's going to turn my room into trash central, he's out of his red-headed skull. If it's the last thing I do, I'm teaching that ginger how to be neat. Chris grabbed a pair of cutoffs out of Derek's bag and tossed them on his bed. He found a concert shirt from the rock group Rat in his closet that used to belong to his dad. He decided Derek could wear it for the day. Chris kept the Megadeth one for himself. He was fishing in the bag for clean underwear when Matt walked in. Dude, I am so glad to be out of that house, Matt moaned, lying back on the waterbed. I'll bet, Chris said. He found Derek's clean underwear and put them with his shorts. I hate my mom, Matt said. Trade? He smiled, hopefully. Chris shook his head. Not in a million years, thanks. That's it, Matt said, rubbing his eyes. I'm trapped. Better you than me. Derek walked into the room, dripping wet. He was carrying the towel he found in the bathroom closet. Chris shot him an irritated glare. Derek made a sheepish oops and closed the door. Matt's mouth hung open. Chris reached over and shut it for him. He insisted Matt tell the tale about why he got grounded. At the same time, he pointed at Derek and scowled. What? Derek asked innocently. Put some clothes on, lobster boy, Matt cried. Who wants to look at your bare ass? Derek snorted, besides you. Matt opened his mouth to protest, but Chris interrupted. If he got Derek going, there would be no end to this. He had such a need to be shocking. If they raised the ante, he would go right along with it. It wouldn't be long before he was standing in the middle of the front yard, 
a naked pubescent lawn ornament with freckles. So, Chris asked, what happened yesterday? Matt smiled. The battle between him and his mom started the moment they got into his father's car. Her antenna shot up out of her head, and she began firing questions at him. I thought you were camping out in Sturgis's yard. Who permitted you to move the campsite? Why didn't you call me and let me know? Did you have something to hide? Where did you get Phil's cooler? How come I didn't see you leave with it? Why was there a faint aroma of beer in the air? Nag, nag, nag. In the short drive home, his head was spinning. Matt fielded every question with such practiced precision, he had to pat himself on the back. I don't get it, Derek said, tying his sneakers. Why doesn't that surprise me, Matt asked. Seriously, Derek said, wrapping his arms around his knees. How did you get grounded if you answered all of her questions? I won the argument, Matt replied. Huh? Chris asked. She didn't catch me doing anything wrong, Matt said. He stretched out his long, hairy legs. It was the first time, too, so I couldn't resist getting in the last shot. Last shot? Derek asked. The cooler, Chris said. The cooler, Matt confirmed. She walked right up to it and opened it before saying a word to me about Dan being road pizza. Matt stopped right there. He never realized how easily his size 10 foot fit into his mouth. All of the color drained from his face, even as Derek's flushed. Matt would never say anything like that on purpose. The hurt in Derek's eyes shattered his heart. He struggled to say something, anything, but the words weren't there. He reached out, but Derek angrily slapped his hand away and ran out of the room in tears. Chris sighed, shaking his head. I don't have to tell you how dumb that was, do I? No, Matt whispered, but it was too late. Chris was gone, chasing Derek down the stairs. They were out the back door and in the yard before Chris caught him. The memory faded as Chris turned on the compressor for the milking machine and let the first ten cows into the parlor. They ambled through the gate and lined up five on each side. He washed their udders vigorously with a hot water hose. He got the first cow hooked up to the milking machine and then something dawned on him. He was distracted and forgot to punch in. Chris jumped out of the valley and went to the time clock. He grabbed his card and punched it making a mental note to pencil in his actual time. He slipped his card into its slot. He was about to turn away when he saw his card, Todd's card, Dabney's card, and one other. Chris looked at it carefully. The extra card belonged to Teddy Bigelow. I forgot about him. Chris went back to the milking parlor with a black cloud over his head. He was almost as mad as Derek had been. That took some talking, Chris thought. Derek eventually came back into the house. Matt was in the bedroom feeling like a complete ass. Derek's anger melted when he saw how upset he was. He slapped his shoulder and told him it was okay. He knew Matt would never be cruel on purpose. They listened intently to Derek as he talked about the good times he had with his brother. There seemed to be a lot of them for all the fighting they did. It was clear he would miss Dan. Matt and Chris saw Derek had already selected his brother's replacement and Chris. Virginia stopped in the doorway. She asked Derek to come into the attic so she could use him as a model for some of her son's old clothes. She told him they were for Craig. It would be easier this way since the two of them were about the same size. She wanted to have them washed and dried by the time he got back from work. Derek nodded and followed her. I'm sorry I snapped at you, Matt, Chris said. I didn't sleep much last night. I'm kind of tired. It's okay, Matt said. I deserved it. I didn't even get the chance to tell him I'm going to be one of the pallbearers at Dan's funeral. You are? Chris asked. How come? I'm tall, Matt replied, lying back on the waterbed once more, with his hands behind his head. He stared at the ceiling. Chris went to the shower. His iPhone rang. Matt picked it up. It was Sandy, checking on Derek. Matt told him he was okay, but there was a strange message on his voicemail from Danielle. It said something about Sandy and Chris being lovers or whatever. Matt gasped when Sandy said, So? 
They spent the rest of the afternoon close to home. Matt ran back to his house and got his baseball glove. He figured it was a good idea to throw a ball around since there weren't any team practices this week. Randy couldn't host them because of a backlog of work. Kevin was supposed to, but Dan's death shot that down. He played pepper with Derek and Stephen Stone, who wandered over with nothing better to do. The summer was boring for him without Sam. Chris helped his mom with the laundry. He was surprised there were so many clothes that would fit Craig. He hoped he liked them and didn't feel funny about accepting them. Derek was so incredibly sad that Chris had to go to work, but he perked up when Jeremy and Craig arrived. They were going to go to the carnival. Derek wanted to go too. Jeremy and Craig were worried about that since they planned to invite Dabney to go and to spend the night. Chris's heart skipped a beat when they mentioned Dabney's name. His face came into his mind, his chocolate brown eyes, the splash of freckles on his face and shoulders. Chris smiled. He wants to talk to me about the pond and apologize. I wish I didn't have to work tonight and tomorrow morning. I'm not sure we'll have a chance. He shook his head. Could he really become friends with us? What would these feelings I have mean then? I'm attracted to Daphne. I know that. Ricardo called me out on it when we were camping. Jeremy saw it all over my face when we were on the phone with Max. I saw something in Dabney's eyes. Is he feeling it too? He snapped his tongue. Will you listen to me? There's only one way to get to the bottom of this. We have to talk. But where can I find the time? I'm working tonight and tomorrow. I'll be sleeping when they get back from the carnival. And tomorrow's the funeral. Chris didn't know. The only thing he knew for sure was that they would talk. He just didn't know when. Jeremy and Craig's voices grew louder. Chris's attention was drawn to them. They were arguing about something that didn't make sense. Chris heard Craig say something about tasting ham every time he bit into a salami sandwich. Jeremy had a similar complaint, only the opposite. They blamed each other. Chris mounted his bike and rode away, wondering about the two of them. In the milking parlor, Chris's thoughts focused on Teddy. His mind filled with the terrifying memory of Hiram's painful assault on him, his clammy, groping fingers, his grunting, alcoholic breath. Only it wasn't Chris beneath the farmer. It was Teddy. Chris ground his teeth, holding back his anger. He prayed his forgetfulness regarding the altar boy hadn't led Teddy into the same black nightmare. Chris thought, could I ever forgive myself? He resumed milking. His suspicion and anger were growing.